All right, on to today's special. We have Untold Tarot by Kathleen Matthews, uh, Untold Tarot, The Lost Art of Re Reading Ancient Tarots. And so this is an interesting book. I really liked it, and it's it's quite popular, you know, um, with folks who are really into Marseille or people who are trying to read sort of more fortune tellery style. I'm thinking of folks like Kelly Bear and Tom Benjamin um, have certainly, you know, promoted it before. I don't know why it took me so long to read this book. I think I was maybe trying to, like, save it or savor it or something, but I should have read it last year. And it's interesting. The She starts off in the preface talking about her frustration with fully illustrated cards or more accurately because all tarot cards are illustrated fully pictorial cards with you know figures and scenes and all that scenic decks can we call them that because and she expresses this in a way i hadn't thought of she's frustrated because the pictures are too specific and when she i had never thought of that before but when she said that i was like oh it's like me and keywords so i drew myself a little diagram here in my journal it goes symbols as the most abstract or from your point of view symbols as the most abstract then you have pictures that are less abstract right because it's a picture representing a thing it could, there could still be a lot of like ambiguity and room for interpretation in a picture but it's it's um more specific and then words 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 would be the most specific right again words can have various meanings and connotation and context and all that but words are more specific so Moving from symbols, which would be like five batons, into what? This is a picture in the Rider Waite Smith. This is a picture of five guys with batons, sort of, you can interpret the picture however you want, attacking each other clumsily, trying to choreograph a dance or something like that, right? But the picture is more specific than this symbol. So that got me thinking. Um, and it just sort of stimulated some interest in my mind. I was like, okay, I see I see where she's going here. And she makes some other interesting observations throughout the, the book. Another one I wrote down was increasing refinement of the baton's court. So the page has a log and then, or the, the valet has a log and then it goes up to a carved lance that the king holds. So from a raw log into like, a club and then the queen has a slightly more fancy thing and then the king has the most fancy thing. So just interesting observations like that um, that she makes throughout the book. Something I agree with her on and that I was sort of a, like applauding her for was that she has huge beef with all of the esoteric, occult, and new age methods of reading tarot. She, she sort of stamps her foot and says this is not how people used to read, which I'm not sure how strong an argument that is. But on the other hand, for me, it's not just about being historically accurate in the way I read. It's actually more useful. To me, a assigning a whole bunch of esoteric stuff on top of a tarot that's already rich with sim its own symbolism and meaning is sort of turns the whole experience into reading flashcards because you have to memorize a planetary association and a Kabbalistic association and a letter of the Hebrew alphabet and a blah, 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 whatever it is, right? And so you have all this like extra information piled on and it gives the card no room to breathe. It, it, you have so much preloaded information that there's, I feel like there's no room for interpretation. It's almost like having a whole bunch of a list of keywords printed on a card or something. So I like that she sort of reinforced this throughout the book, even though I'm not totally on board with her reasoning, but I still agree with her. However, she still seems to cling to a few esoteric interpretations. Um, for example, with the lover's card, um, the earliest depictions of the lover's card just show a couple. There's no third person. Um, and even in the Tarot de Marseille, the third person is Cupid. It's a, it's a god. It's, it's not a human being. Now, there are Marseille decks, and then later on, you get these three people, right? You get a man and supposedly two women. But to my eye, in most decks that I've seen, that's really a couple in front of, you know, maybe it's the man's mother, or maybe it's an elderly member of the family. Um, sometimes it's a male figure. So it's a, a man, a woman, and then another man. And I see that as like, 
a papal blessing or you know, a king blessing the couple or something like that. So th so to me, this has never been about a man making a choice between two women. I guess that's where I'm going with this. And she talks about choices and, and all this stuff in her interpretation of that card. So there's a few places like that where I'm like, well, you say this, but now you're doing this. Um, so points off for that, but just a few, because um, in general, I really appreciate her different take on the cards and her, her tapping back into historic, you know, understandings of things like the role of, say, fortune or a hermit or prudence, you know, the missing, the missing card from the tarot deck, or is it, you know, that kind of thing. Let's see, other things I liked um, were that she includes a lot of illustrations of other decks. So let me go down here. And I can actually show you some of the pages. Um, so she includes examples of Marseille decks, like, like these. But then she also includes a lot of Italian decks and others. For example, on this page, you have the Vandenboer. Um, you have a Minchiati here, these two cards. So you get a lot of different kinds of decks, including a lot of Italian decks, which are very different from the French ones. Um, so she talks about Marseille, but she shows a lot of other things. Now, I think for someone who's just starting out, that might be a little confusing. But for someone who's interested in tarot history and specifically like the printing production history and all that, using all these different examples was really fun and interesting for me. I think my biggest takeaway from her is that she has a very precise and te technical way to come up with extremely detailed readings, way more detailed than I would probably feel comfortable with. And it's kind of inspiring me to up my game and to actually commit a little bit harder to being specific when I'm reading cards. You know, I'll give you examples. She has in here a, a whole bunch of example spreads. So she'll talk about a technique and then she'll say, okay, let's let's do this five card reading as I've described it to you. Here are five example cards. She talks about, I don't know if I'll be able to find it again, but she talks about like this one reading she did where a woman's television was on the fritz and exactly what was wrong with it and that she needed an engineer to solve the electrical problem and blah, blah, blah. Now, I don't know if what she doesn't do is she doesn't give you what the question was. So maybe the woman came to her and said, what's wrong with my television? But if someone just plopped down in front of me and wanted a reading on something and didn't have a specific question, or maybe maybe they were being cagey because they were trying to like test the tarot reader. I've definitely had people like that. They're like, well, you're psychic. You should know what my question's going to be. I don't know that I, I would come off with go get your television fixed by an expert. <laughs> You know what I mean? Or like the wiring in your house is bad. You should have that looked at. So I need to spend more time with her techniques, sort of getting getting to understand her, her various systems. Now I say systems because she gives you different ways of working with numerology and the pips um, symbolically. And you can, you can just pick one if you want, or you can blend them all together. I will read you those just because uh, it's, it's, it's easier if I just give you an example. So this is in her chapter, Approaching the Pips. So she gives you one, two, three, four, five, seven ways. Okay. So by seeing visual correlations to the pips from our own understanding. So like, what is this shape, color, whatever, remind me of, right? By combining suit and number, I think that's something that a lot of us do, you know, a two, okay, it's a two and it's a wand, therefore twos plus wands equals blah, 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 um, by using cardomanic values derived from the divinatory meanings of playing cards. So applying playing card techniques, which are a little bit different, and the associations are a little bit different, applying those to tarot. Um, by seeing the pips as the courts of the four cardinal virtues. So each suit is associated with a cardinal virtue, and therefore all of the pips serve in that capacity. By associating the suits with the functions of our own bodies or with a tree and the numbers with sequential unfolding. So one is a little bit or very concentrated, two is a little bit more, 
three is even more, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, etc. Ten is the, the crescendo. By assigning to the pip numbers the themes found in the numbered trumps, so aces have in common things with the magician, twos have, th have in common things with the papess, etc. And then the last technique is by reading directionally and sequentially to see the story. So, and she applies that to all the cards, but particularly with the pips, you know, what is this encircling? What is this pointing to? What is this, you know, directionally leading your eye toward, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really cool. It, it sounds very complicated and it's, it's maybe sounding more complicated than it is because I'm still kind of digesting this book. But I like that flexibility and kind of blending of styles because I think it gives you quite a range when you're reading, especially when you're reading for other people. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to trying some of those techniques. She also does include a lot of interesting spreads, but her spreads are not like position A is the challenge, position B is how you can face the challenge, position C is the outcome. It's more like make this shape and then read it in a bunch of different ways. And this might also be helpful if I lay out some cards. I got out this deck just to do this. So for example, if we had five cards, oh, these are all in order, okay. If we had five cards, in a line, that. And then how could you read these? Well, you could read them just in a line like you would. Um, let's see if I can kill this ring light. That's a little better. So you can read them just once upon a time. <laughs> you know, this happened, this guy ran into this, this other person looked away, this happened, and then this happened. Um, but you could also read mirroring, like the first and the fifth cards mirror, the second and the fourth cards mirror. This becomes your hinge. So you read one, two, and three, and then you read three, four, and five. So that, so it's like this is a reading, and then this is a reading. And then from all those different readings, looking here, looking here, looking at the shapes and how this is all talking to each other, then you kind of come up with a sort of a final statement, if that makes any sense. So she obviously explains it much better um, in her book. But a lot of her um, a lot of her spreads and things are like this, you know, pull nine cards, put them in a box shape, read them left to right, right to left, read the four corners, see what's in the middle, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it's interesting that she gives you, you know, spreads and things to kind of help guide your eye or to guide your reading. But at the same time, it's not fixed spread positions. And that's the way I prefer to read anyway. So, and then I guess the last point I'll make um, about the book is that Kathleen Matthews reminds us that you can refine your meanings around any, any point of inquiry, right? So you could go, you could take a deck and study it just in the context of work and career and come up with all kinds of, you know, meanings and symbolisms and things related to the numerology and the suit symbols and the individual majors and all of that, like just from a work and career standpoint. And then you could look at the deck entirely from a romantic love standpoint. And, and we, we do that. We adapt our answers to the question, right? But sitting down and kind of pre-thinking about, okay, what could every single 78 cards tell me in a reading about finance? What could every single 78 cards tell me in a reading about, I don't know, travel, an upcoming trip? And I think that would be an interesting exercise. I think that would be an interesting way to do a deep dive is to just consider tarot from one aspect of your life. Because I will admit I haven't, like, I haven't done that. I've just interpreted individual cards in individual scenarios for individual people. But I've never sat down with the whole 78 cards and said, okay, what would happen if any of these cards came up in a reading about 
this or that topic? What could it potentially represent? And it's not so much to fix meanings to say, okay, well, if you're asking a medical question, then the hermit always means you need to go to the doctor, right? But it's a way to sort of pre-explore that so that you're not having to do it cold turkey, if that makes sense. I don't know. I'm still, I'm still obviously chewing over this myself, but it was a cool book and it's really got me thinking. And um, I do recommend it. I do recommend it. She gives you a lot of information and she acknowledges what, you know, the Golden Dawn and other secret societies and esoteric, you know, schools kind of contributed. But she does it in, in such a framework as to say, this is where those common keywords probably come from. And then here's another way to look at it that's more open-ended, more flexible, more applicable to our daily lives.